Uh, brothers and sisters, it is a privilege to stand before you today. When I was asked to speak, uh, I was invited to speak on something that I have a real passion about. But since talking about fishing really isn't appropriate in this setting, I thought I would stick to the gospel, which I'm sure was intended. But in seriousness, brothers and sisters, um, it took me probably five seconds to uh, zero in on this subject matter, um, which I have a great feeling for because I, I, love, I love my students. I uh, love the spirit that is at the LDS Business College. All of uh, my wife and I, our four children, all four of them attended LDS Business College at one time or another and had a wonderful experience here. Uh, one even met her husband here. Um, so it is a, it's just a beautiful place for us and for me. There's one thing that really um, concerns me often because I see too many fall for the partial truths, the inaccurate information that is available throughout the world through the internet or through other places that cause people to stumble and cause people to fall, to have some people lose faith. And so one of the subjects, and some of my students will certainly recognize it perhaps in, in my remarks today, is this idea of putting your trust in the Holy Ghost. It's interesting to me that when, when Jesus healed someone of whatever it was, whatever miracle was wrought, there was a repeated phrase that he tried to teach those who received the miracle, and in so doing is trying to teach all of us. And that is, thy faith has saved thee. Over and over, thy faith has saved thee. The song that was sung by the choir today. There can be miracles if you'll believe. It's a very interesting to me, brothers and sisters, that when the Savior, the resurrected Lord, appeared to his apostles, he, uh, the first time, they touched him. They knew it was him, but Thomas, as you remember, wasn't there. So eight days later, the Savior again appears to his apostles, and Thomas is there. And if you recall, Thomas had said beforehand, when he was not present, to the testimony of the others, except I myself feel the nail marks in his hands and in his feet, I will not believe. I don't think he was being rebellious. I was, think he was just simply saying, I just can't believe it. And of course, when he appears eight days later, Thomas receives the same testimony that the others received and kneels before the Savior and says, my Lord and my God. And then the Savior's very poignant words, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. But I say unto you, blessed are they who have not seen, but yet have believed. And so, brothers and sisters, is this on? Oh, wonderful. All right, there we go. Um, I want you to know that I know that that was, I know that's true. I know it now more than I ever have. But when I was younger and I heard that, I have to admit I thought, I know it's true because the Savior said it. But how can you be more blessed if you have not seen but yet have believed? And that was very confusing to me. And over and over you will see that theme through the Savior's life. In fact, in the Bread of Life sermon, he says something very interesting. This is just after feeding the 5,000. Afterwards, they're following him. They want him to be their king. They want him to be the Messiah, and they track him down in Capernaum. And the Savior then says to them, in essence, I'm not the kind of Savior you're looking for. I mean, he is the Savior, but he knew they just wanted to be fed bread. They wanted the physical things. And then he says this very interesting phrase. It is the spirit that quickeneth, that makes alive. The flesh, physical things, profit nothing. And now this phrase, the words that I speak unto you, they 
are spirit, they are life. His words are spirit, they are life. In other words, when you hear truth spoken and recognize it, that is where truth is to be found. Not in just what you see or hear or taste or smell with your senses. That can be manipulated. And brothers and sisters, if we are dependent on what people put right in front of us, then we are always at the mercy of the evidence of whatever the world wants us to believe. And often the evidence put in front of us seems to contradict the eternal truths that the Savior taught. And so, brothers and sisters, I would like us, if we could, to focus on this theme. I'd like to start with a, uh, a uh, little anecdote that is shared by President Monson beautifully that demonstrates what I hope to convey. I'm always humbled and grateful when my Heavenly Father communicates with me through His inspiration. I've learned to recognize it, to trust it, and to follow it. Time and time again, I've been the recipient of such inspiration. One rather dramatic experience took place in August of 1987 during the dedication of the Frankfurt Germany Temple. President Ezra Taft Benson had been with us for the first day or two of the dedication, but had returned home. So it became my opportunity to conduct the remaining sessions. On Saturday, we had a session for our Dutch members who were in the Frankfurt Temple District. I was well acquainted with one of our outstanding leaders from the Netherlands, Brother Peter Marek. Just prior to the session, I had the distinct impression that Brother Marek should be called upon to speak to his fellow Dutch members during the session, and that, in fact, he should be the first speaker. Not having seen him in the temple that morning, I passed a note to Elder Carla C. Acey, our area president, asking whether Peter Marek was in attendance at the session. Just prior to standing up to begin the session, I received a note back from Elder Acey indicating that Brother Marek was actually not in attendance, that he was involved elsewhere, and that he was planning to attend the dedicatory session in the temple the following day with the serviceman stakes. As I stood at the pulpit to welcome the people and to outline the program, I received unmistakable inspiration once again that I was to announce Peter Marek as the first speaker. This was counter to all my instincts, <laughs> for I just heard from Elder Acey that Brother Marek was definitely not in the temple. Trusting in the inspiration, however, I announced the choir presentation, the prayer, and then indicated that our first speaker would be Brother Peter Marek. As I returned to my seat, I glanced toward Elder Acey. <laughs> I saw on his face a look of alarm. He later told me that when I had announced Brother Marek as the first speaker, he couldn't believe his ears. He said he knew that I'd received his note, that I had indeed read it. <laughs> and he couldn't fathom why I would then announce Brother Marek as the speaker, knowing he wasn't anywhere in the temple. During the time all of this was taking place, Peter Marek was in a meeting at the area offices in Porthstrasse. As his meeting was going forward, he suddenly turned to Elder Thomas A. Hawks, who was then the regional representative, and asked, How fast can you get me to the temple? Elder Hawks, who was known to drive rather rapidly <laughs> in his small sports car, answered, I can have you there in 10 minutes. <laughs> well, why do you need to go to the temple? Brother Marek admitted he did not know why he needed to go to the temple, but that he knew he had to get there. <laughs> the two of them set out for the temple immediately. During the magnificent choir number, I glanced around thinking that at any moment I would see Peter Maurick. I did not. <laughs> Pause. 
Remarkably, however, I felt no alarm. I had a sweet, undeniable assurance that all would be well. Brother Marek entered the front door of the temple just as the opening prayer was concluding, still not knowing why he was there. <laughs> as he hurried down the hall, he saw my image on the monitor and heard me announce, we will now hear from Brother Peter Marek. <laughs> to the astonishment of Elder Acey, Peter Marek immediately walked into the room and took his place at the podium. <laughs> Following the session, Brother Marek and I discussed that which had taken place prior to his opportunity to speak. I've pondered the inspiration which came that day, not only to me, but also to Peter Marek. That remarkable experience has provided an, an undeniable witness to me of the importance of being worthy to receive such inspiration and then trusting it and following it when it comes. Now, brothers and sisters, I love that. There's just a couple of phrases I'd like to call your attention to. He said in there, I had a sweet, undeniable assurance. Now, how do you explain what that feels like to somebody else? That's pretty tough unless you too have at some point in your life felt that feeling. But if there's three words I'd like today's remarks to focus on, it is these by President Monson. I've learned to recognize it, the Spirit, the witness of the Holy Ghost, to trust it, and finally to follow it. And then that Spirit, brothers and sisters, I'd like to tie that to what Jacob says in the Book of Mormon. For the Spirit speaks the truth, wherefore it speaketh of things as they really are and of things as they really will be. We must learn to focus on that. Again, now from Alma, faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things with your eyes and your ears and touch and smell, a perfect knowledge of things. Therefore, if you have faith, you hope for things which are not seen, I would add, yet, but which are true. And then, of course, this profound counsel at the end of the Book of Mormon, which could be a theme if we would just rivet it to our brains by the power of the Holy Ghost. You may know the truth of all things. I'd like to share with you just a couple of little experiences. First one. Just prior to uh, serving a mission, uh, about a, roughly a year before I went on my mission, I was out of high school. I was one of the youngsters, and my birthday was late. And two of my best friends uh, were found out that we could go to California and work there and earn money for our missions. Uh, he had some connection to the Disneyland Hotel. We thought, wow, that would be really something. And so uh, we decided that we would go to California. But it was kind of an important decision at that point in our lives. So I actually uh, made it a matter of prayer, as they agreed to also. And I fasted. And I talked with people. I went to the Doctrine and Covenants, where it says you must study it out in your mind and then ask if it be right. And if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. And I was looking for the burning. And I was, I really, I talked to everybody. And you can imagine, almost all my friends that I knew and worked with at my job, when I asked them, they all thought, oh, definitely, go to California. You, you, get, you get pay for your mission. You get to live away from home and have that experience. And they listed all these things. And uh, I really wanted to go. My two best friends were going. Um, but this was an important time. This was the last time I'd really be with my family, and so that was kind of important to me, too. Well, it finally came to the date that had been set for them to leave, for us to leave. And it was the morning of that day, and my friends called me and said, Hey, so are you coming or not? And I said, I just haven't received an answer yet. And they said, Well, you're kind of running out of time. We're going tonight at 7 o'clock. And I, I said, I'll, I'll definitely have a decision. And I went before the Lord and was a, a, 
And I said, Heavenly Father, I will do whichever is the right thing, whichever thou would know is best for me, I will do it. Whatever inspiration thou gives me, I will do it. And I prayed, and I said, should I go? And I waited. Nothing. Okay, should I stay? And I waited. Nothing. Now, it was about uh, two hours before we were supposed to leave, and uh, I finally was a little bit desperate. And I called a uh, seminary teacher who lived in our state who I knew and was friends with. I said, I, in fact, he used to teach here, Brother Bliss Roberts. I said, I said, Brother Roberts, I said, I have done everything I know how, and I'm just not getting an answer. And he says, well, what have you done? And I said, well, I've done this, and I explained everything and my thought process. And then he was inspired, no question, because he said, well, why don't you tell the Lord the process you've gone through? Talk to the Lord. Often we think of the Lord, sometimes I think we treat the Lord as if he's the great guru on the mountain, which we must climb. And then when we get there, what is the answer? I've climbed. Okay. And the truth of the matter is, is he's our father. And when we discuss things with him as a father, it really changes that relationship. It becomes very close. He says, draw near unto me and I will draw near unto you. So I got off the phone, I went into my bedroom, I got on my knees, and I had a conversation with my Heavenly Father. It was a different experience. As the discussion went on, as clear as anything in my mind, I knew that I should stay, but I still asked. I said, Heavenly Father, I feel that I should stay. Is this the right answer? And then I got an impression, which is very difficult to describe with words, but it brought tears to my eyes, and it was total clarity. I got up off my knees, I called my friend, and I said, I, he said, did you, get, did you get your answer? I said, yes, I did, I'm staying. And there was a pause, and he said, I said, you don't believe I got an answer, do you? I could tell, he's one of my good friends. Well, I question it. Well, how do you know? Well, how do you describe that? I had a hard time questioning it, and after our 10-minute conversation, I remember I was questioning the experience I just had. Does that make sense? Maybe it's what I really wanted. Maybe it's, well, I went that night and watched my friends drive off into the darkness. I didn't hear from them for a few weeks. And then uh, to make a long story short, everything fell through. It didn't work out. They got in an accident on the way home. Fortunately, they were not harmed. Uh, but it caused them to lose a semester in school and it set them back. And, and it wasn't because I was righteous and they were wicked, but in both cases they said, well, we don't really know what the answer is, so we're just going to go. And, uh, but I remember at that time just, just chiding myself, how could I have not trusted that answer? It's very interesting what Elder Packer said. Describing the promptings from the Holy Ghost to one who has not had them is very difficult. Such promptings are personal and strictly private. My prompting, brothers and sisters, was not a burning in the bosom. It was something very different and very real. The Holy Ghost speaks with a voice that you feel more than you hear. It is described as a still, small voice. And while we speak of listening to the whisperings of the Spirit, most often one describes a spiritual prompting by saying, I had a feeling. Revelation comes as words we feel more than we hear. I'd like to share with you another anecdote, a wonderful story. This is Jesse Knight. Uh, Jesse Knight was born in Nauvoo. He was the son of Newell Knight, if anybody's familiar with uh, church history, Newell Knight and Lydia Bailey Knight. And uh, his father passed away as they were coming across the plains, and his mother raised him and his siblings in Utah. But somehow during his teenage years, he had lost his faith. He did not have a testimony. He did not believe in the gospel. Later, he got married and had a, started a family, and he was living in Payson, Utah. His very faithful mother, Lydia Bailey Knight, was a temple worker in St. George. And one day, she came and visited him. It was her last visit to him. And she said, Jesse, the Lord has told me to stop worrying about you that you are going to be all right and you're yet going to come back into his church. And Jesse looked at his mom and said, 
Mom, I'm as far away from the church now as I've ever been. He just, in essence, he said, I, I just don't see how that's going to work. Well, she left with complete faith that that's what would happen. She trusted the voice of the Lord. Well, a few years later, Jesse's, the well on their farm was poisoned by a rat that had fallen into it and drowned. And their little daughter, a one-year-old Jenny, got very, very ill. So ill, in fact, that the doctor said, there's no hope. His wife said, Jesse, let's send for the elders so that they can give her a blessing. He said, no, I'm not going to send for the elders. I don't believe in that stuff. Well, as the child diminished and was very near death, his heart was finally softened. And he said, go ahead and call for the elders. Two good home teachers came to his house, laid their hands on that little infant's head, and gave her a blessing. Immediately, she gained consciousness and sat up and was healed. Brothers and sisters, Jesse was humbled. Now, he had seen a sign, that's for sure, but it was the faith of his wife and faith in the priesthood that made that happen. But the faith of his mother was also manifest. Because of that, Jesse repented. He changed his life. He turned his life around. He cleansed his life, and he started to recognize once again the gift of the Holy Ghost he'd been given so many years before. Well, as the years went on, one day he was out about 25 miles from his home in an area called Godiva Mountain, which is near Eureka, Utah. As he was there, he felt the most powerful impression that came to him and said, this country is for the Mormons. And what he meant, what the feeling said to him was, the church needs help financially, and this is here to help him financially. Now, the church didn't have big mining operations or anything, but Jesse felt that, and he followed it. So he went with a friend out on the mountain, and they were going around prospecting, looking for a site, and he finally, finally found a spot that he thought would be good. He said, what do you think? I feel like we should dig right here. And his friend looked at him and said, really, why? I just feel it. What do you think? And he said, uh, I think it's humbug, which means I think it's a farce. And so Jesse said, so be it. And he called it the humbug mine. He, he laid claim to it. He went to his house. He, put, he mortgaged his house, brothers and sisters, to pay for this effort to mine. Day after day, they were mining going straight down into that mountain in the humbug mine. Now you got a picture, he's put everything on the line and all they're digging up is rocks. But in the midst of that, he still trusts what he felt the Spirit say. Again, the Spirit came to him and he shared with his son. He said, he said, son, the money, this mine is actually going to make us very wealthy, but we must do with that wealth what the Lord wants us to do. Well, 150 feet down, they struck lead and then silver, and it became a very well-producing mine. With that mine and its proceeds, Jesse Knight brought up other mines all throughout the area. And that mine actually purchased businesses all through the state to put people to work. After the Edmund Tucker Act had been put into place and had just diminished so many of the church's resources that the church was almost bankrupt, it was Jesse Knight that came in and and supported the church with his funds. He saved Brigham Young University. For us Utah fans, I question, I'm just kidding. But he did. He saved, if you go to BYU, there's a Jesse Knight building there, okay? He deserved every amount of attention that he got. Well, Jesse Knight believed firmly this. The earth is the Lord's bank, and no man has a right to take money out of that bank and use it extravagantly on himself. And so by the standards of the amount of money he had, he was pretty amazing. Most mines worked seven days a week. He, of course, kept the Sabbath day holy and had his mines shut down on the Sabbath day. His mines produced more than his neighboring mines, which were not, which were running seven days a week. Many of them started to follow his example. Because he was doing so well and they knew he was a Mormon, in fact, they called his mines the Sunday school mines because on Sunday his miners were in Sunday school okay, and going to church. He even built a town that was called Knightsville. This is a picture of it. Uh, and in Knightsville, uh, 
almost all of them were members of the church. Everyone was welcome, but he actually wanted to make a place that was clean. There was no saloons there, and there were no brothels, and there were none of the things that a typical mining town had. Um, those who worked for him had great respect for him. I could tell you more about him. He is a remarkable man. But the key here, brothers and sisters, is this idea of listening to the Spirit. Jesus said something that you're very, very familiar with, but it's profound in its implications. He said to his apostles, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, brothers and sisters, men say a lot of things. Just turn on the news. Just read textbooks. Men say all sorts of things. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Jesus saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And note what Jesus says. Blessed art thou, Simon or Peter. Why? Because you didn't learn that from flesh and blood. You didn't learn it just because someone told you and tried to prove that to you. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And now this significant statement. And I also say unto thee that thou art Peter. Upon this rock, the rock of Revelation, I will build my church. And what will the gates of hell not prevail against? Revelation directly to a person. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. President Monson also said this. There are so many kinds of voices in the world. We are surrounded by persuasive voices, beguiling voices, belittling voices, sophisticated voices, confusing voices, and I would like to say comical voices, which are talented com comedics who make fun of things sometimes that we consider sacred. And if we're not careful, we start to accept that feeling. I might add that these are loud voices. I admonish you to turn the volume down and to be influenced instead by that still, small voice, which will guide you to safety. Remember that one with authority placed his hands on your head after you were baptized, confirming you a member of the church and saying, receive the Holy Ghost. Open your hearts, even your very souls, to the sound of that special voice which testifies of truth. I'd like to end with one more story. Emma Pauline Berth, this is my grandmother. She's very, she's a hero of mine. She was married to another hero of mine, of course, and that is my, my grandfather. They're from Germany, East Germany. They uh, met there, they married there, be um, and they raised a family there. They lived in a place called Schneidermühl, which is now in Poland, because after World War II, the border changed. It is now called Pila. And uh, while he was there, he built up a business from nothing, incredible faith, until a very pro into a very prosperous business, and was doing very, very well, of course, until World War II came. Well, things started to change. Uh, this is part of their family uh, a little bit later. Just FYI, that's my mother. All those people have passed to the other side of the veil, except for the little girl my mom has her arm around. Next to her is her brother, whose name was Nephi, after Nephi in the Book of Mormon. Nephi and my mother's oldest um, brother will both be killed in the war, as will the sister that's standing in the front there, the tall one with the braids, who will also die. I mention that because my grandmother, at a very difficult time in the war, the Russians were coming closer now to where they lived, my mother, grandmother prayed for help because my grandfather had been drafted into the army. He was already in his 50s, and they were sent out to stand up to the Russians while the main army was taken somewhere else. Well, they were quickly captured by the Russians and my grandfather, she had not heard from him. Meanwhile, my mother, my grandmother knew that she had to leave that place. 
She prayed for help when suddenly a friend said, hey, I'm taking a milk train out of here. If you and your family want to be on it, I'll be leaving at this time. It was midwinter. It was freezing cold. They pulled their belongings on sleds and left everything in their home. They put that on that train, and she got on that train, which was headed toward Berlin. It took a very long time because of all the all sorts of delays that were happening and so forth. Um, they finally made their way to Dresden. But on fe February 15th in Dresden, they were on the outskirts of the city when they heard the bombing sirens go off. Dresden was leveled. Here's a picture of what Dresden looked like after that bombing. The people that uh, they were staying with, um, their, their husbands went to help people in Dresden to do what they could do to, to lend service. They were also they never returned. They were killed in the fire bombings. Well, as the war finally came to an end, uh, my grandmother had lost everything, and she did not know what had happened to her husband. They were living with some other families in a place trying to make ends meet. When my grandmother was away trying to find food, her, my mother says her and her sisters were there when they got word from a good friend of the family that their father my wife's husband, my, my grandmother's husband, had been killed. They were devastated. They uh, immediately uh, prayed. They said, you know, mom's been through so much, we cannot tell her what has happened. And they made an agreement. Well, when grandmother came home, she could see a bunch of puffy faces. And she said, what's the matter? And she, they said, oh, nothing, nothing. We were just, and they made up some story but she could sense something was different. And so she did what a good German grandmother does. She went to her daughter's bedroom, or where her daughter was staying, who kept a good diary, and she looked in her diary. <laughs> and in there, she felt the absolute devastation when she read what she read, that her, they had heard that their father had been killed, and they had agreed not to tell their mother. She could hardly stand up. She was on her knees, just can you imagine the situation? As she prayed fervently for help and for guidance, suddenly the Spirit came to her and bore witness to her that her husband was not dead, but was still alive and needed their prayers and their faith. My mother said she remembers when her mom came down the stairs and looked around the room and said, I know what you all think. You think Father is dead, but I have prayed, and Heavenly Father has told me he is not dead, but he needs our faith and our prayers. I will fast every, every week on, for one day a week until I feel like it is long enough, and I invite any of you who want to to join with me. Well, brothers and sisters, for 13 weeks they fasted every week, and she suddenly had the impression that it was, that it was enough. Now, you need to know that during that time, people came to her, members of the church, well-meaning members that came and said they thought she just can't accept the truth. It's obvious here. They even brought her a map and showed her where his body had been buried. But she, that's what men said, but she trusted in the Lord. To make a long story short, one day she looked down the street and there came a man she couldn't even recognize. He was missing his right arm. And he came to the door and there was her husband. He had been alive. What had happened? He'd been captured. He, his uh, right arm had gotten gangrene. He was in a Russian hospital for 13 weeks with a high fever. They could do nothing to save him. He actually said the Russian doctors were very kind to him. And they finally said, Father Berth, you have a choice. You either are going to die or will have to take your right arm. And you can live. He said, I want to live. And they amputated his arm 13 weeks, exactly the time. And immediately he started to recover. Now, brothers and sisters, there are a lot of things to know, and I won't tell you the rest of the story because we're out of time, but I do want to say this. President Monson had it exactly right. We must learn to recognize the Spirit, to follow and or to trust the Spirit, and to follow that Spirit. I want to end simply by saying this. I have not seen Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ in the sacred grove, but I know it happened by the power of the Holy Ghost. I have never had the Spirit bear witness to me that Joseph Smith was a perfect man, but I have had the testimony borne witness to me by the Holy Ghost that he was the Lord's prophet. 
and that the Book of Mormon is true and that Jesus is the Christ. I cannot prove that to anybody unless they will listen to the same voice that has told me. I know that voice. I know it is real. I know it is true. It's my hope and prayer will do exactly what President Monson said, that we'll put our trust in the things of the Spirit and follow it. And instead of turning away from the voice and breaking commandments, as so many people do when they're challenged, I invite you to make your life more pure so you become even more clean and more available to hear that voice. Of these things I bear testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.